There are only three ways that you can survive a pandemic caused by a potentially lethal, highly contagious novel virus like SARS-CoV-2. The first way is the way we can eventually think of surviving something. You actually get infected with the virus. Your body mounts a defense against that virus and either with or without medical assistance, your immune system kills off the virus before it kills off you. It turns out that people who manage to survive a COVID-19 infection earn some pretty robust protection against a future symptomatic infection. They earn some really, really robust protection against a future infection requiring hospitalization. And it seems like there's only a small number of people worldwide who have managed to survive one COVID-19 infection only to be killed by a subsequent infection. Of course, there's certainly a filtering effect going on where people that might be susceptible to dying of a COVID-19 infection are probably most likely to die from a COVID-19 infection that they get before they've had a chance to develop natural immunity to it. Regardless of how you might survive a COVID-19 infection, it seems pretty good that you will then survive the rest of the pandemic. Of course, that comes with the risk of death. It comes with the risk of permanent damage to your lungs, to your heart, to your brain. It comes with the risk of suffering quite significantly as your body fights off the virus, even if you don't need advanced medical care. It seems quite irrational to actually want to earn future immunity by intentionally infecting yourself with SARS-CoV-2. That brings me to the second way to survive a pandemic, which is the way most people globally have managed to survive so far. And that is to avoid absorbing enough viral particles to develop an infection in the first place. The easiest way to do that is just to stay away from anybody who might be infected. That actually takes a fair amount of resources to be able to pull that off while providing for your daily needs. Many of us might be able to do that for a couple weeks at a time, but eventually somebody in your household is going to have to come into contact with other human beings. At that point, you're trying to create barriers between somebody who might be shedding virus and the parts of your body that might absorb that virus. That includes distance, which is actually way more protective than a lot of people appreciate. That includes wearing a mask, which is most protective when worn by the person shedding the virus, but also seems to provide protection for the uninfected as well. It also includes reducing your time of exposure, which isn't often talked about as a tactic to avoid infection, but if you're going to the grocery store, you're much less likely to get infected if you get in and out quick, rather than strolling along and taking your time. You're much less likely to absorb enough viral particles where you get an infection, from showing up at a restaurant, grabbing your food and carrying it out, than sitting there and eating your entire meal there. That's a great way to survive, but the problem is, as long as there is community spread, as long as there is risk of absorbing enough virus to get infected, when you go out into your community, you have to continue taking those precautions, including not going out in a community. Anybody watching this video, probably knows how hard that is. It's hard financially, it's hard socially, it's hard psychologically. The third way to survive a pandemic exists as a luxury, and that is to develop the protection against a future symptomatic infection, against the damage that could come with an infection, against the risk of death, without actually suffering an infection and its risk for permanent damage and its risk of death. That's where the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna come in for people in the United States. And that's the luxury that my family was able to choose for ourselves. I get the skepticism, I really do. We were skeptics ourselves along with many of our friends in healthcare, but we obviously reached a point where we were more comfortable getting an mRNA vaccine than taking our chances with this virus. And that's what this video is about. If you watch channels like mine, you're probably a natural skeptic. Any rational person should be skeptical of mRNA vaccine tech at first, but that's different than having a closed mind to it. If you've already decided that you're just never gonna get an mRNA vaccine at all, I'm not gonna change your mind. If you think this whole thing is some conspiracy of any flavor, you just might as well stop watching now because I am not going to entertain that nonsense in the comments. If, however, you inherently trust the biochemists 
and the virologists who have studied these vaccines and determined that they are safe, but you want to see more to allay your concerns, I hope to help you by showing you exactly how I got there. As you probably know, the mRNA and mRNA vaccine stands for messenger RNA. It exists naturally in our bodies. Our DNA makes it to tell our ribosomes, which is the protein factory in our cells, what proteins to make. The biggest thing to help me bridge the trust gap with these vaccines was reminding myself why messenger RNA exists in the first place. Our DNA is locked inside a safe room inside its cell. That's what the nucleus is. It keeps stuff from being able to mess with the DNA, including the rest of its own cell. DNA can't simply saunter up to a ribosome and tell it what protein to make. It needs to send a message to it from inside its safe room out to where the ribosomes roam. It has to send its instructions across the nuclear envelope. That's where messenger RNA comes in. It's our cell's snail mail written by our DNA and sent out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm where it interacts with our ribosomes. This was my big aha moment because using mRNA for a vaccine takes advantage of safety factors that are already built into our cells mRNA outside of the nucleus has no mechanism to enter the nucleus. mRNA that is in the nucleus has no mechanism to affect our DNA. Just think about it. It doesn't pass the sniff test. For our DNA, which is the most basic component of complex life, to use a system of messages that could blow itself up. DNA is sending messages through memos. DNA is not sending messages by lobbing hand grenades. The internet is awash in illustrations of this process, this one-way flow of messenger RNA from the DNA out to the cytoplasm where it interacts with the ribosomes and then is destroyed. But I realize that none of them really make sense until you understand the biochemistry that they're trying to represent. I am not going to try to explain that in this video. Instead, I came up with this explain it like I'm five model. This is my not patented model of mRNA manufacture, transport, utilization, and destruction. In this model, the DNA is represented by this punch. In this case, it codes for a nice little heart shape. These post-it notes represent the mRNA material. This funnel represents the pore through the nuclear envelope. Anything going across this envelope must pass through this pore. This white piece of paper is the cytoplasm, the rest of our cell, and this pen is a ribosome. There's no way for our DNA to contact our ribosome directly. The DNA needs to send a message to the ribosome to tell it what to make, in this case, a heart. So, the DNA codes instructions for the ribosome. In doing so, it includes a portion on the mRNA that allows it to pass through the pore. In this case, it's represented by this glue strip. And you'll see, this allows the mRNA to pass through the pore. But as it's passing through the pore, that part actually gets removed from the mRNA and it returns to the inside of the nucleus where it is broken down to be used as a component of future mRNA. So the mRNA comes out of the pore with no mechanism whatsoever left to signal transport through the nuclear membrane. It cannot accept any kind of mechanism for transport that way in the first place. That little flag here only signals transport from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. This nuclear transport signal doesn't even leave the nucleus with the mRNA. So now this mRNA is out in the cytoplasm and it runs into a ribosome and it tells the ribosome what kind of protein to make. 
make a little heart. And it might be available to make another heart. At some point, as programmed by the DNA, this mRNA has made as many hearts as it's supposed to. At which point, our ribosome signals to the rest of the cell, this thing is done. And then it is destroyed and the material is actually recycled. It's broken down into small components, which their size allows them to pass back through the pore as parts and then reassemble into mRNA by the nucleus again. It's a really efficient process. So now you may have noticed these three little guys out here. These are viruses and they have spike proteins, which are actually more like key proteins because these don't physically spike into the cell wall and cleave it. They mate up with a lock on the edge of the cell wall that then allows the cell to open and pull the virus inside. But these spike proteins, the spikes on the outside of the virus, are what get that done. Here comes our vaccine factory. And what this vaccine factory is doing is taking mRNA that lacks any nuclear transport signal and it is just coding for a spike. That's it, just the spike, not the whole virus. And instead of being wrapped up with a transport signal, it's in a ball of fat that has affinity for the membrane around the cell. When that little ball of fat comes into contact with the cell, the cell absorbs that ball of fat and the mRNA gets released into the cell. There is nothing on this piece of mRNA that will allow it to pass through the pore. There's nothing in the cell itself that could accidentally get attached to this piece of mRNA that will allow it to get into the nucleus. There is nothing on this side of the nuclear envelope that will allow a piece of mRNA to change the DNA. It just is impossible. That's not what mRNA is. That's not what mRNA does. There's no mechanism for this to happen. Instead, it enters the cell, runs into a ribosome, and then the ribosome makes these little spike proteins. And just like with the mRNA that is made by our DNA, this little piece of mRNA is programmed to have its run and then the cell's natural system recognizes that it's done and it breaks it down and gets rid of it. And that's the end of the mRNA from the vaccine. It works exactly like the mRNA that's produced by our DNA. It uses the same built-in safety mechanisms that start with DNA producing a message that cannot harm itself, a message that can only flow one way through the nuclear envelope, a message that can only be used by ribosomes and a limited number of times, a message that is automatically destroyed, broken down, recycled when it has done its job. The process for the mRNA that's made in a factory is the same once it's in the cytoplasm as the mRNA that is made by our DNA. That's why the mRNA vaccine is so inherently safe. A cell is already set up to protect the DNA from it. It's already set up to use it appropriately. It's already set up to get rid of it when it's done its job. There's more than how these messenger RNA vaccines take advantage of our cell's natural safety mechanisms to make this tech potentially the safest vaccine tech to date. These mRNA vaccines have no preservatives. They're so fragile that even a traditional vaccine preservative can damage them, so deep cold is used to preserve them instead. Regardless of what you think of the safety of 
thiomazole and its ethyl mercury in preserving traditional vaccines, there's nothing like that in these mRNA vaccines. mRNA vaccines need no adjuvants to prime our immune system like needed by traditional vaccines. Instead, they use our cells to signal the danger to our immune system. Adjuvants are ingredients in many traditional vaccines that are used to signal to our immune system that the vaccine's contents are a threat. These ingredients are most commonly aluminum salts. mRNA vaccines don't need an adjuvant because we don't actually want to signal to the immune system that the contents of the vaccine are a threat. The mRNA instead instructs the cells to produce exactly the kind of protein that the immune system is automatically going to see as a threat. There's no need for any kind of chemical signaling to the immune system at all. In fact, these mRNA vaccines are simply strands of mRNA suspended in teeny tiny balls of fat contained in saline. That is it. You might also be concerned with how fast these mRNA vaccines came to market when a traditional vaccine might take several years to develop, but that's because the human trials were done concurrently. They were done all at the same time instead of being done consecutively with a lot of time between each different trial. There was increased risk, but it was borne by the test subjects. And thankfully, we learned that they tolerated this vaccine tech very well without suffering anything other than the symptoms that we already associate with taking the second shot of these vaccines. By the way, those aren't really side effects. They're actually symptoms of the primary effect of these vaccines. It's signs that our immune system has been activated and is working against the material that looks like the virus. The fact that these mRNA vaccines trigger such a symptomatic immunological response is a big reason why they're so effective. There are plenty of places where you can learn about why that's the case, so I'm not going to repeat them here. I just wanted to share that part of my decision process leading me to trust in the safety of these vaccines over the safety of the virus in a way that I haven't seen illustrated anywhere else. If you still remain skeptical, traditional vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 are on the way. It might still be a few months before they're available, but they will be there for people who prefer the vaccine tech they know than the vaccine tech that they don't. Regardless of what you decide for yourself and your family, keep doing your best to avoid being infected. Keep doing your best to avoid spreading an infection that you might not know you have. We have fewer days in front of us than we have behind us before this big danger is over, but only if we all continue to do our part in preventing its transmission. Be sure to subscribe for more videos on topics like mRNA vaccine tech. I really appreciate you watching the Tech of Tech and hope to see you next time.